In this session, I'm going to discuss some of the common reasons why regional anesthesia may not always work as planned, and consequently how we can prevent and manage it. There is an inherent failure rate in regional anesthesia. This can be reduced with good technique and with experience, but never quite to zero. This is clear when you look at the published literature where you never see 100% success rates. As an example, in this study comparing a single corner pocket injection technique of supraclavicular block with a much more elaborate triple injection between trunks, there is still a significant failure rate. Four out of every hundred patients in this case, even with the more meticulous technique. Let's start by looking at failure of central neuraxial blockade. Now, before we attempt to answer this, it should be noted that this will vary by the technique under consideration as well as by the definition we use for failure. I have broadly divided failure into technical failure, which is the inability to enter the epidural or intrathecal space, and therapeutic failure, which is the failure to provide adequate surgical anesthesia or analgesia, despite what appears to be correct placement of the needle and delivery of the drug into the correct space. So therapeutic failure can run the gamut from complete absence of any block to inadequacy of block height, inadequacy of block intensity, or inadequacy of block duration. One of the things that may surprise you is just how common failure of surgical anesthesia after injection of local anesthetic is. I used to think of spinals as virtually foolproof if we can puncture the dura, obtain CSF, and inject local anesthetic. So I was a little surprised to find that this does not provide adequate surgical anesthesia in approximately 3% of patients, or if you like, 3 in every 100 patients. This data comes from a large series of thousands of patients using standard local anesthetics like bupivacaine or lidocaine, and appears to hold regardless of whether this is in a community or teaching hospital setting, and regardless of whether we're talking about obstetric spinals for cesarean section or spinals for non-obstetric surgery. What is even more surprising is that if we look at the complete absence of any block whatsoever, this is also remarkably high, although much more variation is seen here in the reported incidents. What about lumbar epidurals? As you might expect, given that the technique is a little bit more complex, the incidence of failure is higher than with spinal anesthesia. Reddy and colleagues define failure as requiring replacement of the epidural or institution of a major alternative modality, including PCA, and they found this to be 27%. Now, this appears to be lower in the obstetric population who tend to have less challenging anatomy. The overall failure rate in one study was 12%, broadly defined as inadequate analgesia or no sensory block after adequate dosing, but also including accidental dura puncture and failure to obtain CSF with a combined spinal epidural technique. Half of these failures were secondary failures, that is, the epidural was at least initially in the right place, but failed to maintain adequate analgesia. If we consider thoracic analgesia, the failure rate is even higher. Although thoracic epidurals have a reputation for being harder to perform than lumbar epidurals, the failure rate of 32% reported by Reddy and colleagues is rather concerning. Unfortunately, more recent data that comes from the control arms of studies of epidural waveform analysis and ultrasound-assisted thoracic epidural support this. Tran and colleagues had a 23 to 24% failure rate in their control groups, although their criteria is quite strict. They looked for absence of loss to coal over more than two dermatomes within 10 minutes of a formal bolus of lidocaine. Aoyoung and all in their study of ultrasound-guided thoracic epidural reported very similar failure rates in their conventional arm. They assessed their epidural success at the end of surgery and defined failure as an absence to loss of coal and a pain score exceeding 5 out of 10. They found a rate of 21.6%. So neuraxial failure appears to be much more common than we would think based on what is reported in the literature. The more important question is what we can do about it. Let's start with technical failure, which is common to both spinal and epidural anesthesia. Technical failure in neuraxial blockade is most often due to challenging anatomy, including poor quality surface landmarks or distorted bony anatomy. However, suboptimal technique also plays a part, particularly in less experienced hands. 
Now, there are a few small nuances to basic technique that, in my experience, can minimize technical failure. I cover this in depth on a separate YouTube video, but we'll mention them briefly here. The first thing is to ensure that you are handling the needle correctly. At its most basic, this means ensuring the needle is going where you want it to. Controlling movement of the overlying skin is important, as is ensuring that any redirections are made in appropriately small increments. Especially in the older patients who often have narrowed interspaces, it is vital to be extremely meticulous in this regard. It is also worth noting that needles don't always travel in straight lines. This may have more to do with the type of needle tip than the gauge, as this study showed. Even 18 gauge toy needles can deflect 2.5 to 3.5 millimeters when inserted to a depth of 5 centimeters. The takeaway here is to be aware that it can happen, and perhaps also to insert the needle with its bevel facing kefalet rather than sideways, so that it doesn't deflect laterally but rather up and down, which is easier to correct for. The second thing is to learn to be very aware of the characteristic feel of different tissues as the needle passes through them. A slow controlled insertion helps in this regard. In addition, if bony contact does occur, an educated guess should be made as to which part of the vertebra one is striking and redirect accordingly. And ultimately, this should translate into the mental construct of a 3D model of the lumbar spine, which will inform any subsequent redirection. We can minimize technical failure if we can better visualize spinal anatomy, and this can be done with either ultrasound or fluoroscopy. There are some important differences between the two. Fluoroscopy is a real-time technique, whereas ultrasound is usually pre-procedural. Ultrasound gives you a better appreciation of the bony anatomy relative to the skin surface, whereas fluoroscopy directly visualizes the bony structures and can also be used to visualize catheter placement and epidural spread of injectate in real time. However, while ultrasound is now almost universally available to most of us, fluoroscopy remains a specialized and less accessible resource in the operating room setting not to mention that it carries a concern of radiation for both the patient and the operator. Finally, both involve a learning curve if they are to be used effectively. There is good evidence for the utility of ultrasound in reducing technical failure of neuraxial blocks. Uh, in a systematic review, we confirmed that ultrasound significantly reduced the risk of failed lumbar punctures, spinals, or epidural anesthesia by almost 50%, with a number needed to treat a 34 there is also evidence to suggest that ultrasound may also actually increase the clinical efficacy of epidural analgesia. These are two of the larger studies that compared the efficacy of lumbar epidurals inserted using either an ultrasound or landmark guided technique. One involved a single practitioner, but the other involved 15 first year residents performing the epidural. And the result was surprisingly consistent between both studies. The failure rate, defined as inadequate analgesia requiring replacement of the epidural, was more than halved with the use of ultrasound. There is generally less evidence for ultrasound in thoracic epidurals, but this is one important study which compared the use of pre-procedural ultrasound versus palpation to identify landmarks before performing thoracic epidurals. They use ultrasound to count the levels, mark the midline and the interlaminar spaces, and the ultrasound exam was accomplished relatively quickly, under two minutes in all cases. Now, there were no statistically significant differences in the performance parameters between groups, although there is perhaps a trend to fewer needle passes in the ultrasound group. This is supported by a significant difference in the number of skin punctures required, and I would call your attention to the 30 to 40% of patients that required more than one skin puncture and particularly the number who needed three or more skin punctures for success. What this data tells us is that basically when an epidural is easy, it's easy. It's when it's not an easy epidural that the value of ultrasound becomes evident. Ultrasound reduces the difficulty of difficult epidurals. Another interesting observation similar to the lumbar epidural studies was that ultrasound influenced efficacy of epidural analgesia. The ultrasound group had significantly lower average pain scores in the post-operative care unit and had a lower epidural failure rate, which was defined as no dermatomal loss of cold sensation and a pain score of more than 5 out of 10. 
Let's turn now to therapeutic failure, beginning with spinal anesthesia. There are two common causes. First, failure to deliver an adequate dose of local anesthetic into the intrathecal space. This can result from spillage or from injection into the epidural or subdural space. The second reason is maldistribution of local anesthetic. Now, one solution to the problem of misplaced local anesthetic is careful needle handling to minimize any displacement once CSF has been obtained. And this is particularly important with pencil point needles where the opening is set back a distance from the actual tip. It has also been recommended to routinely rotate the needle to 360 degrees as this will reduce the chance of a dural flap diverting some of the injected local anesthetic into the epidural or subdural space. I personally always do this as there really is no downside to the maneuver. Once injected within the CSF, local anesthetic does not always distribute evenly and studies have shown that the concentration of local anesthetic in the lumbar system is unrelated to the height of block that is achieved. The second thing to consider is that we are injecting in the cistern around the cord equina, but what we need is rostral spread to the lower thoracic cord for surgical anesthesia or analgesia. This ties into the question of whether a failed spinal should be repeated or not. The answer depends somewhat on whether there is absolutely no evidence of block or is it a block that just doesn't rise high enough? In addition, what the presumed cause of this might be, whether local anesthetic has failed to reach the CSF or whether there was maldistribution within the CSF. The main concerns here are what dose to use in the second spinal to prevent an inadvertent high spinal anesthetic, but also the risk of neurotoxicity to the cauda equina in the event that maldistribution occurs yet again. Here are some tips that may prove helpful in making this decision. First, aspirate at the end of injection. I personally never used to do this because I couldn't understand the rationale for it. However, if you cannot get CSF at the end, it increases the likelihood that the needle tip may have become misplaced. And then in the event of spinal failure, technical error becomes a more likely cause than maldistribution. If there is complete absence of lower limb block, always assess the sacral dermatomes for evidence of a saddle block, especially if hyperbaric solutions are used. Allow at least 15 minutes to elapse if possible before deciding to proceed with the alternative plan of anesthesia. And if the spinal is repeated, it is worth modifying it to avoid recurrence of the errors that might have contributed to failure. Most importantly, do not exceed the total maximum dose that you would have been prepared to give that patient. What about therapeutic failure of epidural analgesia? Essentially, this boils down to being in the right place with your needle and catheter. Now, loss of resistance is a time-honored technique of confirming entry into the epidural space, yet it lacks reliability. And even if we get into the right place to start with, the catheter won't necessarily stay there. Catheters may enter the subdural space, they may fall out, or they may exit the space, particularly if advanced too far. Why exactly is loss of resistance unreliable in identifying epidural entry? This may be due to anatomical factors such as cysts in the interspinous ligament, or more commonly midline gaps in the ligamentum flavum, which occur anywhere from 10% in the lumbar spine to 18% in the thoracic spine. Other causes of a perceived loss of resistance are passing from the interspinous ligament into the paravertebral muscles or into the thoracic paravertebral space or pleural space, all of which have been described. One way to prevent this may be to avoid excessive lateral to medial angulation and instead adopt more of a paraspinous approach, keeping the angle to the midline to 5 to 10 degrees at the most. This may in fact be what is happening when the so-called midline approach is used for mid-thoracic epidurals and is to be recommended. Should you use air or saline? Saline appears to be the more widely used and taught technique nowadays and it does have certain theoretical advantages. It offers a more definitive endpoint than air, and because the injection of saline pushes dura and vessels aside, it may reduce the incidence of dural puncture and intravascular catheter placement. Patchy blocks have also been attributed to air bubbles within the epidural space, and the use of saline may help avoid this. <laughs>
The main argument for using air appears to be the avoidance of confusion of CSF with saline, particularly in combined spinal epidural techniques. Ultimately, there is no conclusive evidence to support one over the other, although what evidence does exist is sparse and of low quality. Now, other methods have been described to overcome the limitations of loss of resistance. One such method is epidural waveform analysis, which only requires a pressure tr transducer kit and a length of sterile tubing to connect it to the hub of the epidural needle. This makes it accessible to almost everyone. The presence of a pulsatile waveform indicates that the tip lies within the epidural space, and this has been shown to have good positive predictive value, although still not completely infallible. In a randomized controlled trial of thoracic epidurals performed by residents, the use of epidural waveform analysis resulted in an impressive reduction in the epidural failure rate. Time to complete the block was longer in the waveform analysis group, but it's worth noting that this analysis resulted in reinsertion of the epidural in 40% of the group. While we do not know how many of these changes in management were actually warranted, it probably did contribute to the overall success rate in that group. Another method is epidural stimulation using a specialized epidural kit. This is particularly useful for ensuring that the catheter tip is placed at a desired vertebral level. A special adapter may also be used with a regular epidural catheter that has been primed with saline to conduct current. Essentially, a motor response in the truncal muscles is observed at a current threshold of between 1 and 10 milliamps if the catheter tip is lying within the epidural space. Anything outside of these limits suggests that the catheter tip is lying somewhere else. A recent editorial highlighted the utility of epidural stimulation, but one obstacle remains the need for specialized equipment. One potential solution is to use a stimulating peripheral nerve catheter as the epidural catheter as it is equipped to stimulate with current. Finally, just as with spinal anesthesia, epidural failure can be due to maldistribution due to anatomical barriers that obstruct the spread of local anesthetic or the advancement of the catheter. The epidural fat compartment is discontinuous and connective tissue bands dividing the epidural compartment have been described. However, local anesthetic bolus administration can usually overcome the patchy block that results from this. Let's turn our attention now to failure with peripheral nerve blockade. There is a simple formula to avoid failure of peripheral nerve blocks. Put the correct dose of the correct drug in the correct place in the appropriate patient undergoing the appropriate surgery. Let's consider drug and dose to begin with. The common issues here is a block that is either slow to develop or a block that doesn't last long enough for the purpose that you intend. We commonly classify local anesthetics into rapid onset, short duration agents such as lidocaine and mepivacaine, and long duration but slower onset agents such as bupivacaine and ropivacaine. Duration is often the more important factor, so even in blocks designed to provide surgical anesthesia, drugs like ropivacaine are often used. The specific technique is often not that important in determining onset. You see here, for example, that both infraclavicular and supraclavicular blocks have similar onset times for complete anesthesia. What is more important to note is that it takes at least 15 minutes, and in some patients up to 20 minutes, for surgical anesthesia to fully develop. So what can you do to fill this time? A block room can solve this issue, but if you have to uh, do your block in the operating room, this time can be used for patient positioning, skin preparation, and surgical draping. Many patients also prefer to be sedated intraoperatively, and this can be initiated early on to cover any residual deficiencies in the sensory block. A common question is whether local anesthetic mixtures are helpful in balancing speed of onset and block duration. This is somewhat controversial, but at Toronto Western Hospital, we routinely use a mixture of 2% lidocaine and 0.5% bupivacaine for surgical anesthesia. And as this study of infraclavicular block shows, the onset of sensory block with a mixture of mepivacaine and bupivacaine is almost the same as mepivacaine alone and certainly faster than bupivacaine. With respect to duration of sensory block, mixtures provide for a duration that is longer than just the short-acting local anesthetic alone 
but it's certainly shorter than if using long acting local anesthetic alone. Two other factors to consider are concentration of local anesthetic and total mass administered. Higher concentrations generally result in faster onset due to a greater gradient for diffusion and higher dose or mass of local anesthetic tends to result in longer duration, although there is a ceiling effect to this. Getting the drug into the right place has become much easier with ultrasound and it has allowed us to reduce the minimum effective dose for many blocks. There are still a small number of proponents for deliberate intraneural injection on the basis that it results in very rapid block onset. While this is true, most people, myself included, are unable to confidently differentiate between extrafascicular or intrafascicular injection, thus significantly raising the risk of serious nerve injury. As detailed in another YouTube video, I recommend injecting into paraneural compartments, as in my experience, this provides the optimal balance of safety versus efficacy. Nevertheless, you will still see studies supporting techniques such as this intracluster injection supraclavicular block. However, the only advantage is a slightly faster onset. Surgical anesthesia success rates are the same if you use an intertruncal injection approach. These findings were the same when the intracluster block was compared to an auxiliary block. The issue, as I've said, is how can you be sure that what you are seeing here is not an intraneural or intrafascicular injection. The answer is you cannot. In this cadaveric study of that same intracluster technique by very experienced practitioners who were injecting only 0.2 mils of dye, the injectate remained extraneural in only 32% of specimens. In 44%, the dye was seen in a subepineural location within the nerve. In 24%, dye was seen within the perineurium, by definition intrafascicular, and in 90% of these subperineural injections, there was intrafascicular dye. My recommendation is therefore only aim to breach perineural fascial layers. Every nerve and plexus has a perineural fascial sheath that can be targeted for safe and effective blockade, and this can be identified with training and experience. The last piece of the success puzzle is to make sure that you are matching the right block to the right surgery. And this is based on a good understanding of where the pain is actually coming from. It goes without saying that this requires good anatomical knowledge, particularly of innovation of different structures, but it also requires some knowledge of surgical techniques. As an example, consider peripheral nerve block for hip fracture surgery. Multiple options exist and this article attempts to rate which might be the best in terms of efficacy. However, it ignores an important point, which is that not all hip fracture surgery is the same. The importance of knowing the details of the actual surgery being performed is highlighted in this study, which correlated skin innervation with the different incisions for hip surgery. Note that the lateral femoral nerve only innervates the area below the greater trochanter, and the area superior to that is innervated by the iliohypogastric and the subcostal nerve of T12. The area posterior to this is innervated by the dorsal rami of L1 and L2. This means that covering T12 and L1 is actually quite important for post-operative analgesia of certain hip incisions. But post-operative pain doesn't just come from the skin. It also comes from surgical trauma to muscles, joints, ligaments, and bone. And this will depend exactly what kind of operation is being performed. Is it a dynamic hip screw in the example of hip fracture surgery, a bipolar hemiarthroplasty, or an intramedullary nail? Remember therefore, when planning regional anesthesia, do not just consider skin innervation, also consider muscle and bony innervation. Motor nerves in particular are much more important than we think. They transmit muscular pain and also pain from joints that these muscles are acting on. Even when it comes to dermatomal maps, remember that these are very much generalized in the textbooks. Every individual is different. There is also overlap of innervation with every patch of skin usually innervated by more than one spinal nerve root or nerve. And note that whether or not there's decreased sensation may depend on what sensory modality you're testing. The take-home messages are that 
trying to selectively block an area is difficult and that sensory testing itself is not always 100% reliable. This applies to peripheral nerves as much as it does to dermatomes. In this study, they found tremendous variability in the area of the hand supplied by each of the three main terminal nerves. And even more surprising, there was an area that was not consistently supplied by any of the three nerves. The possible explanations here are the overlapping nature of nervous innovation, as I have said, the high degree of inter-individual variation in innovation patterns, and possibly contributions from nerves that are not traditionally thought to innovate the hand itself. I'm going to finish with this last point. It's very important to set the right expectations for yourself, for the patient, and for the surgeon. With adequate training and experience, you can expect your successful blocks to work 99% of the time. But put another way, you can expect one out of every 100 of your patients to have a suboptimal block. Deal with this by setting patient expectations appropriately. This does not mean blatantly warning the patient that the block is going to fail or might fail, which will create feelings of anxiety and lack of confidence, but rather explaining the gradual onset of loss of sensation, the difference between not feeling pain but perhaps feeling pressure as the surgeons do their work, and always reassuring them that no matter what, you will not let them suffer or feel pain during the surgery. This means having a plan B. Surgeons can always give some local anesthetic supplementation, and there is nothing wrong with giving additional sedation or systemic analgesia as needed. So in summary, these are the essentials of managing block failure. Strive to optimize your technical skills, with the most in fact important factor here, in my opinion, being the attention to detail. There is always room for improvement. It goes without saying that imaging of underlying anatomy is helpful, and ultrasonography is thus a vital skill to acquire. But a probe alone won't help you if you don't have the anatomical knowledge to make sense of the images, and more importantly, to choose the right block to do in the first place. Block failure happens at some point to all of us. Always have a backup plan and be clear as to your thresholds and criteria for when to implement it. Most important of all, do not let your patient come to harm or suffer. Place safety before efficacy and before ego.